Jesus, you were going to kill that guy. Of course. I'm a Terminator. Listen to me very carefully, okay? You're not a Terminator anymore, all right? You just can't go around killing people. Are you the legal guardian of John Connor? That's right, officer. What's he done now? I just need to ask him a few questions. There was a guy here this morning looking for him, too. Yeah, a big guy on a bike. Has that got something to do with this? No. Hey! I figured that part out for myself. So what's the deal? My mission is to protect you. Yeah? Who sent you? You did. 35 years from now, you reprogrammed me to be your protector here. This time. So this other guy, he's a Terminator like you, right? Not like me. The P-1000. Advanced prototype. Come with me if you want to live. John, you got to go now. John! Go! Now! In the summer of 1991, Terminator 2 Judgment Day was released, produced on the largest budget at the time, costing just over $100 million. A large chunk of the costs were eaten up by the state-of-the-art visual effects and elaborate stunts. The film was highly praised on release from fans of the original film and critics at the time and broke many box office records, raking in over $519 million worldwide, which was incredibly impressive for the time. It was nominated for many awards that year and scooped Oscars for its visual effects, makeup and sound editing. When I was a kid I recall the crazy marketing for the movie, and just like Batman in 89, you couldn't avoid it. The trailer and TV spots were on all the time, and I was desperate to see it, but alas I was too young to see it in theatres. I did however manage to get the toys they produced to tie in with the movie. It's always funny seeing the old action figures from the 90s that were based on movies. The toy manufacturers took many liberties with the licenses. The T-1000 looked very odd, and the Arnold Schwarzenegger figure with the interchangeable arms. I always wanted a toy where you could put the skin on the endoskeleton, but I rarely saw it in the shops, and when I did I could never afford it with my pocket money. Talk of a sequel had been kicking around shortly after the first film was released but several issues were stopping the production, such as the technical difficulties of realising the T-1000. Thankfully, after feeling satisfied with the results of the visual effects in the Abyss, James Cameron could push forward with his vision for the sequel, but a hurdle still remained. There were disputes over ownership between Hemdale Film Corporation and Carol Co. Hemdale were experiencing financial difficulties, and Arnold Schwarzenegger urged Carol Co. to bid for the rights. They eventually settled on $5 million for the franchise in 1990, resolving the legal block. After The Terminator, James Cameron had great success with Aliens, producing what many consider the best film in the series, but there are also many fans who consider the 79 film superior. James went on to direct The Abyss, which used computer-generated effects to simulate 3D water. The movie proved a commercial failure, but with many James Cameron films, when it came to home video, the extended version of his films were always superior to his theatrical cuts. The Abyss found its audience on home video, thanks to the Laserdisc format. In 1992, when the film came to home video, it was extended in length by 17 minutes, and this is often referred to as the special edition cut. It had unseen footage of Michael Bean visiting Sarah in a dream sequence, Sarah and John removing the chip from the Terminator so he can reboot and begin to learn more. 
added scenes of expository dialogue and more scenes of T-1000. The best of the new stuff for me personally was when the T-1000 reforms near the end after being frozen and his CPU is glitching a little bit as he struggles to hold shape and gets stuck to things he touches and you see him refreshing his image often. The version to own of this at the time was on Laserdisc. James Cameron was a big supporter of the format and three of his films were given that special edition treatment on Laserdisc such as Aliens, The Abyss and of course T2. Terminator 2 was released so many times on the expensive format I've lost count. It even got a 16x9 anamorphic release on Laserdisc known as the Squeeze Edition which also got released twice in the 16x9 format. That's how popular T2 was on home video. The best release to get on Laserdisc was the Epic Box Set had tons of extra content and commentaries. All of this stuff was ported over to the DVD release known as the Ultimate Edition, but that version I believe was missing the Guns N' Roses music video, but it did feature even more scenes which could be unlocked to gain the new cut which had the new ending. The new ending proved quite interesting, but you can tell they cut it for a reason. It doesn't seem to work and it does come across as a bit cheesy. There have been loads of releases on DVD and Blu-ray known as Extreme Editions or Skynet Editions. It's getting a bit silly now like the Evil Dead series which got so many re-releases but hey people seem to keep buying them. They haven't really produced any new content for the new releases and they just seem to be recycling the old later disc extras but thankfully James Cameron did provide a new commentary with co-author William Wisher a few years back which is definitely worth a listen. I think with all the new releases the picture quality isn't getting that better and the film was shot on Super 35mm. So basically, if you watch the pan and scan version, you are actually seeing more of the picture. James Cameron thought ahead for home video releases and hated watching anamorphic releases being transferred to TV with awful pan and scan versions. Just watch a pan and scan version of Star Wars, then watch the widescreen version. You will know what I'm referring to. For Terminator 2, he masks the image to 2351. So you are actually zooming in on the image, creating a more grainy visual, but it does look artistically better in the scope format. So there hasn't really been huge leaps and bounds to the original picture since I saw it on Laserdisc. The Laserdisc transfer was considered one of the best of the format and still holds up well today considering it's far from high def. The movie starts with images of the war after Judgment Day where humans battle against the machines. Sarah Connor narrates saying Skynet sent another Terminator back in time to kill John Connor when he was a child, but thankfully another Terminator was sent back to protect him. It cuts to the past with Arnold Schwarzenegger, the T-800, arriving and needing to see clothes. He enters a local bar and asks a biker for his clothes, boots and motorcycle. They don't think he is serious until he refuses to leave. They attack and fail miserably. He doesn't kill them but scares them enough to give him what he wants. Arnold gets suited up and speeds off. The new Terminator, the T-1000, arrives and kills a local police officer and finds the address of John Connor. John is in the care of foster parents after Sarah Connor's failed attempts to destroy Cyberdyne and was chucked in a mental home. Opposing as a police officer, the T-1000 arrives at the foster home and manages to obtain a photo of John who has already gone off with his mate with an epic ginger mullet. To the arcade, the parents seem a little concerned that John is in trouble after an earlier visit from Arnold. Both Terminators track John to the arcade. John spots the T-1000 believing he is a real cop and in an attempt to escape John speeds off through the fire exit and spots Arnold approaching him. Arnold points his gun at John and tells him to duck. John escapes on his bike as the two Terminators duke it out. A T-1000 proving to be more powerful than the T-800 pursues after John in the truck. But Arnold saves John in the nick of time. He reveals to John he is here to protect him. The T-1000 does everything by the book and attempts to impersonate John's foster parents anticipating John's return. John is spooked out that his mum is acting weird and too kind. The T-800 clearly knows what's going on and tells him they are dead. Arnold suspects that the T-1000's next move will be to attempt to kill and copy John's mother Sarah. To avoid attention, John makes the Terminator swear that he won't kill anyone as they head to the hospital to break Sarah out. But Sarah is already on the case after overhearing the police alert that the same guy who killed multiple police officers in 1984 has been spotted that day in a mall. During her escape attempt, Sarah encounters her old enemy in Arnold and believes he is still after her. John calms her down and the Terminator confirms he is here to help. The T-1000, their real enemy, is just behind them, attacking the group as they narrowly escape in the lift, but not before he demonstrates some of his own advanced abilities. The Terminator informs Sarah that Miles Dyson is solely responsible for the development of Skynet, and both must be destroyed to prevent the war on mankind. 
The Oscar winning visual effects still hold up really well today. At the time they blew everyone away just like Jurassic Park did a couple of years later. When I was a kid every time you saw a TV show talking about movies or technology you always saw scenes from Terminator 2 with the T-1000 emerging from the flames. This shot really sold people on what computer generated effects could do. CGI had been used in small doses a couple of years before in Willow with the morphine technique. Flight of the Navigator, Labyrinth and ILM created the first photorealistic effect in the young Sherlock Holmes movie. T2 was the first to portray realistic human movement and used multiple morphing techniques for a feature film. You will notice the CGI actually improves as the movie progresses. It starts off with minimal use, then it gets more creative as the film progresses, especially when the two Terminators fight at the steel mill. I love the shot when Arnold attempts to punch the T-1000 and his head morphs into his hands and twists his arm and slams him into the wall and also when he's cut in half with a nine bar and then pulls it out of his waist. But T2 is not just about CGI, it has loads of clever shots of front projection through the chase scenes, in-camera puppet shots of the endoskeletons in full form and with effective movement and the stunt work is truly spectacular. I love the shot when the T-1000 is soaked in liquid nitrogen and he struggles to walk as he begins to stick to the ground. Incredible sequence as he starts to fall apart, very clever and above all original. Terminator 2 is the bridge between old and new special effects technology and James Cameron being the great artist he is, he uses them all with great effect. It's a shame he has become a bit obsessed with new technologies and visual effects techniques with his recent feature Avatar. Wouldn't it be great to see him return to doing smaller movies again? I doubt that will ever happen, plus it takes him forever to get his arse in gear to make a movie. I don't think we really need an Avatar 2 and 3. The underrated composer Brad Fidel returns to compose the score to Terminator 2. This time he has way more money and time to produce something very epic. He brings back the amazing theme tune he created for the first flick and adds loads of new themes and action beats. The majority of the score, just like the first film, is mainly underscoring to set the mood and atmosphere, but the music is instantly recognisable. The theme of the T-1000 is very creepy and every time you hear that sound you know he's nearby. There are many great moments where the music really kicks in. When Sarah attempts to escape from the hospital, the chase towards the factory is my favourite. Incredibly tense and the way the music builds up, it's like it belongs in a film trailer. And of course the music when the T-800 lowers himself into the molten metal in the factory always makes grown men cry. You know, you, you think I'm unemotional, don't you? I can be emotional! Jesus, I cried like a child at the end of Terminator 2. You know, with this, the thumb and the molten... You know? Brad Fidel says he is often pleasantly surprised by the feedback he has received over the years from young musicians and filmmakers who were inspired by his work on T2. He thought the score wouldn't lend itself to easy listening and would only really suit it matching the visuals to the film. There was a release of the soundtrack in 1991 and it was re-released in 2010. There was no new material but the audio quality is better, it sounds far less compressed. The soundtrack is easily available on CD and on iTunes. Terminator 2 received many conversions to home computers and consoles. The most popular version was the coin-up called T2 the Arcade Game. It was a light gun game that was very successful and was converted to the Super Nintendo and Mega Drive. Both versions were pretty faithful to the arcade. There were a number of sprites reduced in scale and scrolling effects removed, but they played the same. I did play the Mega Drive version a lot and man I found it way too hard. It took me forever to get past the levels where you protect the car against the oncoming Terminators. And why are the Terminators gold? A better conductor of electricity, I suppose? The first computer I ever owned was the Commodore 64. I got the Terminator 2 bundle pack. Ocean Software produced the home computer versions. The structure of the game followed a similar style to the Batman game, having platform segments with driving levels similar to Spy Hunter and mini games. The game was also pretty hard. Luckily, I had a rapid fire joystick and could get past the one-on-one -on -one fighting levels pretty fast. You really had to memorise the driving levels, so it was trial and error. The Amiga version had the nicest graphics, I remember the puzzle segments featuring on the TV show Games Master. I do believe the game was pretty popular, I do have a soft spot for it, despite its flaws and short length of the game, and it was the first game I ever owned. The Mega Drive and the SNES also received a similar structured game produced by the notoriously awful LJN. The game was ridiculously bad. It played like a dog and the controls were terrible for the driving sequences. Many players failed to get past these levels and gave up. There are many gamers who have successfully completed the game, but it's not a game you can pick up and play and feel satisfied with. I would definitely avoid this version. 
There were conversions to the Game Boy and Game Gear, but again, they were not very good and received average reviews at the time. To be honest, there isn't really a definitive game based on Terminator 2 that's really good. The arcade is good fun, but not an amazing game. I think the first film had the best conversion of a video game available. In late April of 1996, the T2 3D Battle Across Time ride opened in Universal Studios Florida. It was a sort of mini sequel. It was a live action show interacting with a 3D film. The running length of the show was about 12 minutes and it cost around $24 million, making it the most expensive film shot per minute. James Cameron shot it in 70mm and with the latest 3D technology. For the main show, once guests were seated, they put on their safety visors to watch a demonstration of the Terminators in action. However, John and Sarah arrive and disrupt the proceedings, followed by a T-1000 Terminator from the future, whom they engage with automatic weapons. The host of the show, Kimberly Duncan, tries to stop the T-1000, but the attempts fail as she is killed off. A second Terminator portrayed by Arnold Schwarzenegger bursts through the movie screen on his signature Harley Davidson motorcycle to rescue John. It takes John back through the portal and into the future war between humans and machines. John and the Terminator make their way across the war-ravaged landscape as they head towards Skynet. Along the way, they are chased by flying hunter-killers, three mini-hunter killers and a Terminator endoskeleton. The duo successfully penetrate and descend with the audience into the Skynet core, where they battle the new T-1 million. The Terminator finally sends John back to the present, where he stays behind to blow up Skynet and the T-1 million. A few of my friends did get a chance to see the ride, and they all loved it. I personally have never seen it, but thankfully some people filmed the show and uploaded it to YouTube before it closed in late December of 2012. First things first, Terminator 2 is probably the best sequel ever made. It does everything right from the get-go and gives you what you would expect from a sequel. There are many great sequels out there just to name a few like Empire Strikes Back, Godfather Part 2, Superman 2, Dark Knight and Toy Story 2. But there is something about T2 that in my eyes holds the number one spot. In my previous review of the Terminator I said it's hard to decide which is better between them. Terminator 1 has a faster pace to it and doesn't mess around but because of the low budget and time the movie is restricted possibly to a scaled down story but with T2 there is no holding back. As soon as it starts and you see the war, your jaw just drops. All I remember thinking was how did they do that? It is a visual treat. It's not just a CGI that is impressive. The scale of the special effects and stunts are probably the most impressive for me. The chase with John in the truck is intense and the scenes at the end that mirrors the chase in the first film is exhilarating. It gets you pumped when Arnold blasts a T-1000 head on with a machine gun and then flips the lorry over on its side. The movie is nearly 23 years old and has hardly dated. The CGI effects work within the context of the story and are actually quite minimal and with the cost of using computer generated graphics being very high at the time, they use it sparingly. A few years later when CGI became more affordable, filmmakers certainly abused the option and many flicks during the 90s look pretty weak today, but T2 certainly does not. Whilst the first film concentrates on love and the romance between Sarah and Kyle, the theme of family runs strong throughout the sequel, with John having no father and losing his mother to a mental home. With the Terminator arriving, he begins to teach the machine how to act normal, and their relationship strengthens, and he certainly becomes a father figure to John by the end. Arnold Schwarzenegger does a terrific job as a Terminator and was born to play this role. We all know he's not the best of actors, but the role is so well suited for his abilities, and in the film the Terminator does more than just stand there and kill people. As a machine he begins to learn to be more human, Arnold really shows these subtle changes as he begins to develop more human characteristics. There are great little moments when he smiles or pulls a funny face, or even shows Dyson how the bomb charges work. Linda Hamilton gets in great shape for the role, and kicks ass throughout the movie. Her voiceovers are a little cheesy though, when she delivers them. This was Edward Furlong's first acting gig, and he does a very impressive job considering. Kids always tend to ruin movies for adults and can sometimes make or break a film if their acting abilities don't deliver, but Ed handles all the scenes like a pro. It's a real shame what happened to his career later in life and his abuse with drugs. He has done some great performances in other films such as American History X, Pecker, and Detroit Rock City. Robert Patrick only had minor roles before T2, turning up as a bad guy in Die Hard 2. He left a strong impression on many when he showed up as a T-1000, cold and heartless like the original Terminator, and won't stop till he finishes his mission, but also comes across as far more human when interacting with people. He smiles and sounds very polite, and knows how to interact with children. 
like all films that are loved and fondly remembered. They are not all perfect. There are a couple of scenes in Terminator 2 that I have minor issues with. When they arrive in Mexico, the pace of the movie slows down, and the T-1000 is off screen for quite a while. There is good reason because he has no idea where they have gone, but he eventually turns up at Dyson's home after the group have left to Cyberdyne. But I remember as a kid I totally forgot about him. This may be all done for a reason, but I am just being a bit picky. It would have been nice to see more scenes with the T-1000 doing more investigating, but I do have to remind myself that I'm watching the special edition version, so the length is padded out with new scenes. I rarely watch the theatrical cut, which runs at a brisker pace. It's sometimes hard to go back and watch the original cut of movies once you've seen an extended version. Many scenes sometimes get cut out for reason for pacing issues, and are often restored to the extended editions. So the argument for issues with the picture slowing can be justified, but not always valid, because you have the option to change between the different versions available. The Terminator franchise should have ended with this film, and in my eyes it did. The following sequels are drab, unoriginal or totally stupid. The only idea introduced that was original was in Terminator 3. They can't stop Judgment Day, they can only delay it, which is a very sound idea, because other people would have designed a similar AI over time, or the possibility of someone finding some remains of Dyson's work. Some hardcore fans may still prefer the first film because of its gritty style and it is probably a bit more suspenseful, and some argue the sequel looks too clean and turns the violence down a little, but its narrative and the ideas introduced are very strong, and I love learning how the war transpires and how things are set in motion for Judgment Day. To be honest, I love both movies, and they both have their merits in scenes which I love to watch over and over again. Could this be James Cameron's best film? It shows his maturity as a director, and shows he has improved as a filmmaker and as a visual storyteller. Sometimes I feel Aliens is his best flick, and some weeks I feel T2 is his best. I can never make my mind up. I think just down to its scale and grandness of T2 that it just tips it over to being the best for me if I have to pick one now. Everyone and their grandmother has seen Terminator 2, and if you are one of those unfortunate people who haven't had a chance, go and watch Terminator 1 now, then prepare yourself for something truly epic. Hasta la vista, baby. There's no fit but what we make for ourselves. She intends to change the future. Oh, shit! Dyson. Yeah, gotta be. Miles Dyson! She's gonna blow him away! This is tactically dangerous. Drive faster. The T-1000 has the same files that I do. It knows what I know. It might anticipate this move. Killing Dyson might actually prevent the war. I don't care! Haven't you learned anything yet? Haven't you figured out why you can't kill people? Why do you cry? You mean people? Yeah. I don't know. We just cry. You know, when it hurts. Watching John with the machine, it was suddenly so clear. The Terminator would never stop. It would never leave him. And it would never hurt him. Never shout at him or get drunk and hit him or say it was too busy to spend time with him. It would always be there. Oh my God. Listen to me very carefully. It's definitely you. It has to end here. I order you not to go. I order you not to go. I order you not to go. why you cry but it's something I can never do